Good morning. I'm Pastor Ricky Smith, Senior Pastor at Gunnersville First United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us for our Tuesday morning Bible study. We have begun our journey into 1 John, John's letter to the church of his day, really giving them some great teaching on the fellowship of the body of Christ and what it means to be in fellowship with God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, and our brothers and sisters in Christ and what that means as to how we live in the body of Christ and in the world. We are going to cover about the first half of 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 14 today, and hear what John continues to say about what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So let's have a quick prayer, and then we'll read 1 John 2, 1 through 14, and spend a little time this morning covering these verses. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your word and the teaching that it shares with us each and every day. Thank you for Holy Spirit, who makes the written word the living word for us, because we know Jesus' word is truth, it's spirit, and it's life. And we need all three of those things very much present in our hearts and lives. So Father, <clears throat> by your Holy Spirit, guide us, teach us today, as we again hear the teaching of your Apostle John. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. 1 John chapter 2, and we'll read verse 1 through 14. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this, we know that we know him if we could keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Powerful words from the Apostle John for the church of his day, but also for the church of today. That's you and I. Let's just go back to the beginning there in 1 John chapter 2, the first two verses. And I'll read them again as we go and discuss all these verses. My little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, as we think back on 1 John chapter 1, we find the truth of sin. Sin is a present reality in humankind and has been ever since the fall in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. 
So sin is a present reality. <clears throat> and because that is the truth, in 1 John 1, 8, John writes, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But where we hear the truth that sin is a present reality, we also need to hear the truth that forgiveness abounds. In verse number nine, chapter one, 1 John, if we confess our sins, he, God, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have fellowship with the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what John establishes in the first several verses of 1 John 1. And then John goes on to say what we need to hear. Yes, sin is still present, even in the heart and life of the believer, but God has provided an avenue to deal with that same sin. And John talks about that a little more fully in chapter two. So John continues his letter pressing into chapter two by encouraging those in fellowship with Jesus Christ and the rest of the body of Christ to not sin. Our goal in life as followers of Christ is to live a sinless life, to not sin. Paul was very clear when he said, when we follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh and we will not sin. But if we follow the leadership of our sin nature, our desires that, that, are, that, that rise up in us when temptation comes our way. If we follow those instead of deny those, they will lead us into sin. So the apostle John encourages the early church and us today to not sin. So we also find from 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, that we cannot walk in fellowship with the light of Jesus Christ or the life of Jesus Christ, and in fellowship with sin and darkness. Now, John sharing the heart, the mind, the will of God through Jesus Christ encourages the followers of Christ to not sin. If we have an occasion of sin in our life, Jesus has provided a way to properly deal with that same sin. And the good news is Jesus is the way to deal properly with occurrences of sin in our lives. And that's exactly what John begins to teach us now. We remember from verse number nine of chapter one, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But John continues that teaching here in chapter two. <clears throat> John tells us if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What does it mean to have an advocate? Well, the word advocate means one who pleads another's cause with one. So Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, pleading with God the Father for the pardon of our sins. You may remember in Romans chapter 8, these words in verse number 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So Jesus is there, the resurrected Christ, the one who lived and died upon the cross of Calvary as the sacrifice for our sins. That same one has ascended, is, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and is, <clears throat> excuse me, and is interceding for us or praying for us. <coughs> Part of that prayer is that he is praying for our forgiveness when that forgiveness is needed. And, and just kind of putting, putting that prayer in short form, I would imagine as we sin and, and Jesus goes to the Father about our sin, he says, they are guilty as charged because we are guilty when we sin, but it doesn't stop there. Jesus would go on to say to the Father, the penalty has been paid by me because he or she is a disciple of mine. So the Father knows that the penalty for our sin has been paid. So when we confess our sin, when we agree 
with the word of God that we have sinned, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. John also says that Jesus is our propitiation, which means he is the one who is in the act of gaining or regaining the favor or goodwill of someone or something. So Jesus, in his intercession for us, when we have that occasion to sin, in his intercession for us, he is bringing us back to a place of favor and goodwill with the Father. It is his heart's desire to keep us there. So instead of falling out of the good graces of God when we have that occasion to sin, Jesus is there immediately pleading and, and convicting in our hearts and lives to repent of the sin. And as we do, he's pleading with the heart of God to forgive us and to cleanse us even in that moment. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, but also for the sins of the world. There's not a person on the face of the earth that Jesus does not want to be their advocate and be their propitiation. That is good news today. John goes on in verse number three to say, now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. You can know the commands of Jesus and not keep those same commands. But you cannot know Christ in the way that Christ wants to be known and then not follow his commands. So a sign that we know him is that we keep his commands. And when we say we know him, it doesn't mean that we are acquainted with him. It means that we are in deep relationship and fellowship with him. So to say that you know him and then not keep his commandments makes you a liar. You are deceived into believing that you know him and then can still not keep his commandments or continue to live in sin. If that's the case, the truth is not in you. You've been deceived. You're acting out of your true nature. If you're in that condition, you're acting out of your true nature, your sin nature, and you're lying and not out of the nature of Christ who always speaks the truth and is the truth. Think about this. If the person of Christ is in us and we are in Christ, then the nature of Christ is in us and expressed through us. That's why John goes on to say, we keep his commandments. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. Why? Because God is in us, the love of God is in us, and that love and that presence of God is expressed in and through our daily lives. Further on in John's letter, John says, John writes that God is love. That's in chapter four, verse number eight. The presence of God in us must mean that the love of God is in us. That same love is perfected or made complete in us even as God's love has its perfect work in us and through us. God does not fill us with his love God does not give us the experience of his love just to receive it passively. God wants God's love and God's presence to be an active presence in our lives so that it moves us to action towards our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and our fellow human beings in the world. He says, by this we know we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So if we are abiding in Christ, if we are living there, if we've given our heart and life to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and Jesus has come to live in our hearts and lives, then we ought to walk or live just as he did and does. This is how that same verse is translated in the New Living Translation. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. That's why in the book of Acts, believers were called Christians. 
It wasn't a compliment. It was actually a derogatory term in that day. But they called them Christians because they acted like Jesus. Christian simply means little Christ. It should be a compliment to us, but it is a word of offense from the world. They're trying to put you down by saying you are a Christian, just a little Jesus. The evidence of our relationship with Christ, our abiding in Christ, should be seen in, in how we live our lives from day to day. Jesus set that example for us. And as a matter of fact, Jesus points that out in John's Gospel, chapter 14, where he says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. That's John 14, 9. The impact abiding in Christ has on us and on our lives should be easily seen by others. <clears throat> now, I'm going to give you something to think about, and I'm going to take a sip of coffee, and then I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. Think about this. The impact abiding in Christ has on our lives should easily be seen by others. Now think about this. We cannot take a dip in the pool and come out dry. That's just common sense, isn't it? We can't jump in the pool, we can't fall in the pool and come out dry. Being in the pool has an evident, obvious impact on our lives. If somebody fully clothed fell in the pool and crawled out and stood in front of you, if you didn't see that happen, you might ask, what happened to you? You're wet. You would say, I fell in the pool. Someone who has their lives immersed in Christ and Christ fills their heart. You can't take a dip in Christ and live there and come out without him all over your life. John goes on in verse number seven, it's right. Brethren, I write to you, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. This is not new news, this is old news. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. So we're gonna address that word. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which is true in him and in you. So the old commandment has taken on a new life because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Now then, let me share a verse with you from John 14 to try to build a foundation for what we want to share about those words in verse 7 and 8. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. My wife and I had an agreement early in our marriage. We promised each other we would not say, honey, if you love me, you will dot, dot, dot. If you love me, you'll let me buy that new dress. If you love me, you'll let me buy that new car. If you love me, you'll take me on vacation. If you love me, you'll let me do this, you'll let me do that. We did not want the other's love to be a way to gain leverage for something we wanted. That probably makes good sense to you. But how are Jesus's words different in John 14, 15? Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, think about it this way, and we're gonna use scripture to back this up and explain this further. God's love and God's commandments are both an expression of each other. God's love and God's commandments are an expression of each other. Now, you may remember this from Matthew's gospel. Verse 34, Matthew 22. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him, Jesus, a question testing him and saying, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. 
And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now hear what else Jesus has to say. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now that same last verse in the New Living Translation. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commands. So what did I tell you earlier? God's love and God's commandments are an expression of each other. The law of God in the Old Testament was an expression of God's love. And God's love is expressed through the law. Jesus said in John 13, verse 34 and 5, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Well, that doesn't sound so new, because those two greatest commands that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24 were spoken in the Old Covenant. But what makes this new? Well, let's finish the verse. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Listen to this. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. To obey God's commands, like Jesus said, if you love me, follow my commands. To obey God's commands is to enter into the love of God. Because God's commands are an expression of God's love. To enter into the love of God and dwell there is to have the love of God impact your entire life. The disciples' lives becomes an avenue, an expression of God's love. Remember, you can't take a dip in the pool and come out dry. If you enter into the love of God and dwell there, it's going to impact your entire life. John acknowledges this truth when he writes in verse number eight, again, a new commandment I write to you, which, is, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So Jesus is saying the new part of this command, this old command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, has taken on newness of life like this. Which thing is true in him and in you? So Christ is in us. This is new for the people of God. In the old covenant, they didn't have that. In the new covenant, we do. So Christ is in us. Christ is loving us. We have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. These are new things as new covenant followers of Christ. So now we need to live out that newness of love we've experienced in Christ Jesus. The newness, the freshness of an old command is seen in its new expression in the heart and the life of a disciple. Any darkness or shadow that was present in the heart and life of a believer is passing away. Why? John says, because the true light is already shining in us in Christ Jesus. We are in Christ, and Christ is in us. So there is a process of sanctification, or setting apart, taking place as we daily live in Christ, and Christ daily lives in us. Now, verse number 9 through 11 again, illustrates the practice of God's love in daily life or the lack of the practice of God's love in daily life. <clears throat> John says in verse number 9 through 11, he who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. You can't live in the light of God, in the love of God, and hate your brother. He who loves his brother abides in the light. And there is no cause for stumbling in him. Why? Because he's living in the light and can see what's right and what's wrong. And there's no cause or reason for that spiritual stumbling. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. He's been deceived. The person who thinks that he walks in fellowship with God 
and hates his brother has been deceived. Light and darkness does not coexist. You find that out every time you walk into a dark room and flip the light switch to the on position. As soon as the light bulb begins to shine, the darkness leaves the room. Why? Because darkness is simply the absence of light. So when we live in the absence of Jesus Christ, the truth, the light, the life, we live in darkness. But when Jesus, the truth, the light, the life lives in us, we live in light. And the darkness is, is dispelled and we live in the truth. Thank God that Jesus has come to bring recovery of sight to those that are spiritually blind because they have been deceived. Now, John continues to write, I believe and encourage those faithful disciples in the church of his day. He shares something a little bit different now. And for me, it's a very encouraging note and it's a great way to end our time here together today. Verse number 12 and 13. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. Now let's look at those individually. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Life begins at childhood. Christian life has a beginning as well. We are born again. In this new birth, this beginning of life, our sins are forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. We have received the benefit of sins forgiven, yet it is for his name's sake. God wants the world to know that at the foundation of his love is forgiveness. Sin was a revelation of who we are. Forgiveness is a revelation of who God is. Thank God for forgiveness. John goes on and writes, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. Well, we are born and we are children, but we don't stop there. We grow into fathers, mature men and women of faith in the body of Christ. Life continues until one is at a mature place in life, even a place of childbearing, where we are given the privilege of helping lead others into a new life, in a new faith, and a new beginning in Christ Jesus. A father of the faith is one who has matured in the faith due to their long-lasting relationship with God through Christ and their experiences together with God. Faith has been established and faith has grown. So we can talk to them as a spiritual father or refer to them as spiritual fathers. John goes on to say, I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. Well, you know, it's kind of common sense. We don't send children into battle. We even on most occasions don't send old men into battle unless they go in leadership positions. The young men are the ones thought of as the ones engaged in the current battle. The battle is a spiritual battle where the young men, due to some maturity in Christ and due to the wise counsel of the, over one, of the older ones, has found, has found victory over the enemy. One of the blessings of the older generations in the faith is their mature faith and their counsel and encouragement to the younger generations, which is exactly what John is doing to the younger generation in this letter. He's encouraging them and congratulating them that they have overcome the wicked one. Now John kind of repeats himself in the last couple of verses we're going to share today. I write to you little children because you have known the Father. Now, in verse number 12, the Greek word translated children is technia, while in verse 14, the Greek word is pedia. The first term tends to refer to a child who is young in age, and the second term implies a child young in experience. If this is truly the case, if we have interpreted that properly, he may be covering his bases by referring to those who are both young in age 
and young in experience. So he's talking to the children who may be young in age. Or he's talking to those who are children in the faith because they haven't been disciples of Jesus Christ for any length of time. John appears to be addressing all of his reading audience, whether they are young in age or young in faith. And we took that from a commentary for Bible students uh, by D.A. Case and D.W. Holden. Just a great bit of truth there to help us better understand why those two words were used, but they were actually used to mean something different. Again, John writes, I've written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning, an identical statement to verse 13. <clears throat> Maybe he's just encouraging them again. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Victorious battle over the evil one brings about good things in our lives and in our walk with Jesus. John adds these words when he says that statement a second time. Because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, have come with the exercise of faith and the maturing of faith. So now <clears throat> he's telling them they have overcome the enemy because you're strong and the word of God abides in you. They've been to the battle, they've gained strength because the word of God is there. It reminds me of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, where Peter writes to the church and says, May the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So when we're out there fighting the good fight of faith, we're going to grow in our faith. We're going to be perfected or matured or completed. We're going to be established. We're going to be strengthened. And we're going to be settled in that same faith. So John has some great words of teaching and encouragement that he shares with us and I have shared with you today. I hope this has been a help to you in your Christian journey. And I look forward to our time again next Tuesday as we look at the second half of 1 John chapter 2. May you have a blessed day as Christ dwells in you and you dwell in Christ and the love of God touches and blesses every part of your life. You can't take a dip in the pool and come out dry. We can't take a dip in God's love and live there without that same love impacting the complete person that we are. Have a blessed day.